Hello, and thank you for downloading this latest Data Science Central podcast. This is Raphael Knut, your host. I'm a contributing editor with Data Science Central. Today's podcast is sponsored by Gorobi. We very much appreciate Gorobi's support of the Data Science Central community. We are honored to have them sponsoring our event today. This podcast will be about 15 minutes long, and we have one speaker who I'll introduce in just a minute. Today's talk is entitled, Mixed Integer Programming, Bringing Decisions to Data Science. And our speaker is Dr. Edward Rothberg, who has served in senior leadership positions in optimization software companies for more than 20 years. Prior to his role as Gurobi CEO, Dr. Rothberg held the Gurobi COO position since co-founding Gurobi in 2008. And prior to that, he led the ILOC CPLEX team. He has a BS in Mathematical and Computational Science from Stanford University and an MS and PhD in Computer Science also from Stanford University. Ed, thanks for being with us today. Today's Data Science Central podcast traces the history of mixed integer programming, MIP, noting several perils with machine learning. In the process, we briefly discuss the impact that MIP has had on a number of application domains. We then talk about how machine learning and optimization can complement each other, the former making predictions about likely future business outcomes, and the latter suggesting appropriate actions to take in order to take advantage of these outcomes. Ed, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can begin as soon as you're ready to go. Oh, thank you, Raphael. Um, actually, before we dive in, I thought I'd give just a quick overview of what optimization is. Um, so we're a software company in the optimization business, and optimization is quite simply the goal of optimization is to maximize or minimize some objective subject to a set of constraints. Um, and the constraints ultimately come from the fact that you often have activities that compete with each other for resources. Um, so what are resource, what are scarce resources? A few examples, you know, budget or a set of machines or a set of trucks if you're delivering things uh, or a set of workers if you're building things. So a number of places um, uh, resource constraints can come into play. Um, and then you have an objective function, which is something you want to minimize or maximize. So for example, maximize profit or minimize waste or minimize late orders or something like that. Um, and the, the one common theme among optimization problems is that the number of possible solutions the number of solutions you could consider is astronomical. So we typically talk in terms of billions or trillions, but that really just, it doesn't even begin to cover the number of possibilities. And so what our software does, what optimization does, is it systematically combs through all of these possible solutions, and it tries to find some that maximize your objective function. And um, when I say combs through, in a lot of cases, optimization can actually find the optimal solution, so the solution among all the possible solution that give, uh, solutions that gives you the best possible object value for your objective. Uh, thank you so much. Can you, can you give a brief rundown of the history of MIP? Sure. Um, so actually, if you compare optimization, uh, mixed integer programming with machine learning, um, there are actually, actually several interesting parallels. Um, and it's not too surprising. So the main things that are driving the adoption of machine learning and optimization are, first off, the explosion of the availability of business data. So companies just have much more data than they used to have, and, and, and the quality has gotten quite a bit better as well. And then the second factor is just the increase in the available, if availability of computing resources. So you can apply much more computing power to solving these problems. Um, and in, in the case of optimization and machine learning, the basic technologies that underlies these are actually quite old. Um, so some of the fundamental algorithms in these areas are like 50 or more years old. Um, and there have been improvements in the technology. And, and you know, in the case of mixed integer programming, quite big improvements. And so the capability to be able to solve such problems um, in the past 20 years has increased by, I mean, between the machines and the improvements in the, in the software, um, literally factors of millions. Um, and so, you know, as a result, it's now possible to solve problems that were just impossible to even consider solving a short time ago. Um, and as a result, there are lots of different industries where optimization can be applied. 
Um, so we've done tallies and we've counted at least 40 different industries that are currently using optimizations with new ones popping up all the time. Um, but, and so optimization is, near, is not nearly as visible as machine, learnings, as machine learning is. Um, and probably our sense is that the main reason is that the applications of optimization are typically on a much broader, much larger scale. Um, and so optimization is typically used to make some fairly complex decisions where the, the implications are, are highly, of the various choices are highly interconnected. Um, and so it winds up being used in you know, large scale business applications like supply chain planning or electricity markets or those sorts of things, as opposed to machine learning, which is often used for things that are you know, more, more hands on, more tangible, speech recognition, image recognition, autonomous vehicles. And can you give a few examples of industries where MIP is used? Absolutely, yeah. So as, as I mentioned, optimization is used in many different industries, more than 40. Um, just to give a few spe specific examples. Um, so one industry that's really been uh, really transformed by optimization is supply chain planning. Um, what supply chain planning does is it uh, computes a plan for producing something. So you have a factory, you have a set of machines, you have a set of workers, you have a set of raw materials, and you want to figure out the best way to manufacture what it, whatever it is that, that that factory can manufacture to meet customer orders, minimize costs, what have you. Uh, and if you look at the history of supply chain planning through the, I'd say the early 90s, the primary approach that was used to schedule factories was basic rules of thumb. So there were people who were just, you know, who just trained themselves to be pretty good at figuring out what, what, what orders to start when, what materials were needed, et cetera. Um, and, but in the, in the mid to late 90s, what wound up happening is there were a number of supply chain planning software companies that popped up, and they started using mixed integer programming. The technology and the computing resources had advanced to a point where you could actually solve interesting problems using optimization, using mixed integer programming. Um, and if you look now, nearly every software company in supply chain is using MIP to solve the supply chain planning problems. Another example industry is electricity markets. Um, so there's a need uh, when it comes to the production and consumption of electricity to make a market. So to match up buyers and sellers, to set prices, et cetera. Uh, very big, very complex problem. Um, again, through the 1990s, in this case, the late 1990s, uh, the primary approaches were pretty heuristic. So yeah, fairly ad hoc schemes for matching buyers and sellers. Um, but again, in the 90s, in this case, the, the end of the 90s, the early 2000s, uh, mixed integer programming had advanced to a point where it could solve the, the, the core problem in um, electricity and creating an electricity market. And now basically every electrical power market in the world is run using a mixed integer programming model, something called a security constrained unit commitment model. Um, and the, the last example I want to talk about is sports scheduling. Um, so professional sports leagues have very complex problems to solve when it comes to uh, coming up with a schedule for the season. Um, the constraints in these cases are things like, you know, uh, travel. Uh, want to minimize travel. So there's stadium availability. You want to make sure you, can, you, you, you play games in stadiums when they're available. Uh, home games versus away games, et cetera. There's a long list of constraints. Um, and again, through the, um, through the early, in this case, the early 2000s, the primary mechanism for scheduling sports leagues was using um, humans, basically people who had trained themselves to be quite good at coming up with uh, schedules. Um, and again, in the early to mid 2000s, uh, mixed integer programming uh, was adopted. And at this point, nearly every professional and actually college uh, sports league is scheduled using mixed integer programming, using optimization. Would optimization typically be used instead of machine learning or in conjunction? What is your take on that, Ed? Um, yeah, so people often ask us if, yeah, if they're competitors or if they're, you know, if they um, can be used in collaboration. And for the most part, they are complementary technologies. Um, and so, there, so at this point, uh, it's, I'd say it's not typical 
for applications to include both, but it's it's becoming more and more common. We're seeing more and more customers who are combining the two. Um, just to give you a few examples, so one example is uh, we have a we have a customer a company a software company called Blue Yonder, and uh, they use machine learning and optimization together to solve a problem that's called markdown optimization. Where what they do in markdown optimization is they decide for uh, retail stores. Um, you know, they have goods on the shelf, and at a certain point, they want to move uh, certain products off the shelves and replace them with new products. So in order to do, these, do this, they put them on sale, and they want, they want to maximize their revenue um, for putting these things on sale. They don't want to just throw them away. They want to uh, mark down the price and uh, get them off the shelves. And so what uh, this software does is it uses machine learning to actually predict what, what would happen if a a particular product in a particular store were marked down. You know, if we if we set the price of this item to this amount, uh, sales are increased by this much. And then they use those predictions to feed an optimization model, and the optimization model uh, computes an optimal schedule for actually marking down the prices in order to maximize revenue. Um, and the results have been uh, the improvements have been quite substantial. So they can document significant increases in revenue as a result of this of using this approach. Um, and another example of combining them is uh, there's a professor at MIT, Dmitry Bertsimus, and he and a few students have been looking at techniques for using optimization technologies to solve uh, uh, problems that are sort of typically viewed as machine learning problems. Um, in particular, they're looking at uh, something called best subset regression. So regression is a very commonly used technique in machine learning and statistics. And you can actually use optimization to get better results from, from a regression model. Ed, how difficult is this to use optimization? Um, yeah, so people often, often ask us whether a, a data scientist can pick up optimization easily and how the difficulty compares to learning you know, to, uh, traditional machine learning techniques. Um, and what I can say here is most, the most common uses of, of machine learning uh, are regression and classification. Um, so, and those are, you know, those are classical techniques. They're very powerful. And I mean, frankly, they're quite, they're pretty easy to use. Um, and so, you know, comparing optimization to classification and regression, optimization is, yes, it's, it's harder to learn. It's more complicated. Um, but when it comes to data science in general, people don't want to stop with regression and classification, you look at machine learning. There are all sort of all sorts of much more sophisticated techniques out there, like deep learning, reinforcement learning, etc. Um, and these more sophisticated techniques require a lot more expertise. Um, so, you know, in the spectrum, so optimization is harder to learn than regression and classification, but it's actually easier to learn than uh, most deep learning and reinforcement learning techniques. Um, so, our, I mean, our our basic statement is that someone with um, with uh, basic math skills and basic programming skills um, has the tools they need in order to learn how to, to build optimization models. Awesome. Um, Ed, what are some of the main challenges that data scientists faced in using optimization? Um, so really, I think the main challenge when it comes to using optimization is just recognizing when you have an optimization problem. So, you know, when you're con first confronted with a problem, you know, is it a machine learning problem? Is it an optimization problem? I mean, in some cases, as I mentioned earlier, maybe it's both. Maybe there, it's an opportunity to use the two in conjunction. Um, and so as a tool, um, optimization basically, for a data scientist, it expands the set of problems that they can attack, the set of problems that they can solve. But they need a little bit of, ex of um, exposure to optimization to the techniques, to the sets of sorts of problems that are solved in order to be able to recognize when a problem is an optimization problem. This is why we really recommend that optimization be part of any data scientist's toolbox, that they get some exposure to optimization just so they can recognize such problems. Ed, 
Thanks. That was a very interesting discussion. I'd like to thank Orobi again for sponsoring today's Data Science Central podcast, and particularly our speaker today, Dr. Edward Rothberg, for his insight into today's topic. My name is Rafael Knud, and I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event, and I look forward to seeing you all again on Data Science Central's next podcast. Have a great day.